My name is Amit Acharya. I am from uh, Dallas, Texas. As you can tell from my accent, right? No. Uh, I live in uh, Dallas, Texas, but I'm from India originally. Just a second, for some reason. No worries. No worries. I won't touch it. Uh, my role, I'm a head of product for API Connect. API Connect is an API management platform. You heard so many stories, fascinating stories here. So I manage my professional responsibilities are roadmap, product delivery, market, analysts, you know, listening to all of you here, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and then driving for future, right? That's what I do personally. I've got two little kids. They keep me busy. I've got a three-year-old and a, and a four-and-a-half-year-old. So life's busy right now. All right. So having said that, uh, let's take a step forward and just so I get used to it, okay. So I was supposed to present yesterday. I was given a, this slot because I heard there was a broader demand for GraphQL. So uh, more people, less time. Uh, I was scheduled inside, less people, more time. So I think all in all, it summed up well. Uh, three things you will take away today from here, from my session. And if you have to go right now, these are the three things you'll remember, which is we're gonna talk about why GraphQL. First of all, what is GraphQL? Why did we land to GraphQL? <laughs> um, my three-year-old has learned this word, silly, that she uses whenever she wants to get some stuff done from me. Uh, can I get a candy? Dad, it's for fun. One time, silly, please. So I thought, you know what? That way you will remember. Why GraphQL? It's for the end user, the developer. That's it. That's why the simplification is happening in the market. Number two, <laughs> I get this question by default from various people or various customers I meet. So I said, I'm going to you know, proactively answer it. Is it, OK, GraphQL and everybody's hearing about it. What happens to REST? We're going to answer that. Short answer is, it isn't going anywhere. And then number three is, so what, what, what about the, the, the management? And I think the gentleman before me spoke about you know, the management, the life cycle of this new models of interaction. So we all know, you know REST API. We know SOAP from before that. Now we talk about GraphQL. We just heard event-driven architecture. And, and so there is a management piece to it. And we're going to talk about that. All right? So these are the three things we're going to touch here today. All right. So first of all, let's talk about the value of GraphQL. And before I go into this, how many of you have heard about GraphQL? Oh, wow. This is amazing. Awesome. My god, this is the first conference I'm seeing this much interest in GraphQL. Great. And how many of you are actually writing code on GraphQL? All right, so this is, and how many of you are in production with GraphQL? Okay, as I expected, but the first response was awesome. I loved it. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some time to just set some stage of GraphQL quickly, but just for those who are not aware, this side, which is the REST side, right? So in, uh, you know, how does the REST operates and graph operates? REST is basically you have a resource on web. And if you want to define, let's say, my favorite you know, books from my favorite author, you would say, get me all the books. So you get all the books. And then you say, get me all the authors. And you get all the authors. And then you do some magic, some business logic in some of your microservice app, mobile app. I'm not going to go into that. But somewhere you do the magic, and then you show that result to the user and say, here are the best favorite books that you love. Great. In case of Graph, what happens is there are no more, you know, as a developer, you're not really asking for give me books, give me authors, give me the list, and I'm going to do the magic. What you do is you ask exactly for what you're looking for, which means you just send a query as an API and say, I'm looking for books by the author by Amit, let's say. And in the response, I get a single object back, a payload back, which says, you're looking for these set of books, which are your favorite books. So it's basically a single query that, as a developer, you're sending to the system. And what you get back is the answer. All right? That's GraphQL for you, in a nutshell. I've simplified it. This is not about the protocol and anything like that. But the point is, for a consumer, for an API consumer, the guy who's writing the code, the girl who's writing the code, to in a mobile app or, or your web app, they get exactly what they're asking for, querying results out. And, and, the, and, and the real benefit to that developer who's writing this is the round trip reduction. Here, you're making three or four different calls, and you know, you're doing the grunt work and then showing the display. Here, you're making a single call, 
to a single endpoint, and you get exactly what you're looking for. Now, there is no magic here, right? I mean, if you think about it, all GraphQL is basically the complexity from the developer is now shifted to the API provider, right? So you are just simplifying for the end user. That's the value of GraphQL. So tons of questions. So what happens to REST? What do I do with it? We'll get to there. But let me come to here quickly to understand, do we really need GraphQL? You know, what is the history behind GraphQL, and you know, we always have these new solutions. And we, uh, from IBM standpoint, back in I would say December of 2017 is we, when we started looking from a research standpoint. You know, what do we do in GraphQL space? And we we started seeing a trend where this will become, you know, one way of interacting with your data, right? And and this will require the first class treatment for as in for for full management right and you know so we invested and we kind of so let's take a step back to understand why graphql where it is i'm going to go and talk about the 1.0 of apis i would say 10 years ago 15 years ago you know we all talked about soa right there were different protocols different ways to connect with systems ejbs orb you name it and then you know the world said you know what we need a simple message format that's called soap and we are going to use that message format through and describe it through a file called WSDL, Web Services Description Language. And we're going to use that to talk to each other. So life was OK, but the negative piece of that, or in, in, well, not that one, but, but it was very much driven by the API provider. So the API provider, and, and it was pretty much a reflection of your back end. So the API provider, and I work with a lot of financial companies, what they did is they took their IFX schemas as is in the back end and exposed them as SOAP you know, operations. So the consumer, it was like, oh my god, what am I supposed to do? Somehow figure this thing out. So that, that interaction summarizes the, the conversation between API provider and consumer. And if I were to compare, you know, who's the winner here, right? It was, it was to the advantage of API provider, the 1.0. You know, the API provider controls the service. API consumer really did not have that much impact on what was getting defined. So that was, you know, back in the days of SOA, right? Let's jump on to you know, the 2.0 of APIs, which is when you know, HTTP standardization, you know, REST, RESTful interfaces kind of came into the picture. And we all kind of jumped onto the bandwagon of saying, you know what, we need REST APIs. Even if you have SOAP in the back end, XML in the back end, we started on the journey of REST. Uh, journey on open APIs, you heard a lot about it, where you describe APIs in a YAML file. So YAML, you know, and the headaches of having indented YAML files. And then also J uh, JSON payloads, right, which is describing your data object in terms of JSON. So that's your, that, this, is, this is where we are right now. You know, this is what I, we hear from a lot of customers, we hear from you, is the API provider and consumer talk to each other, they work on a contract based on what's required, and both of them participates enough, right? And the consumer discovers through self-service portal, there are analytics, there is security, management. So it's kind of a, a good marriage, right? This is where we are all right now. And then if we were, and you know, if I were to look at the advantages, you know, what I hear most is, you know, it's working really well between API provider and consumer because they both are participating. So far, so good. But there is still complexity involved in terms of how provider exposes the the APIs to how API consumer consumes it. And if I were to say, you know, 3.0 of APIs, and we, we just heard the session before the one that we had here, is it's about, you know, adding to what we have already, which is GraphQL async endpoints, right? And these are, you know, these are the future of where we are going from REST to where, right? Which is graph, async endpoints, all of that. And if I were to summarize what is Graph, GraphQL is a query language you know, where consumer defines the data they need. It's a very strongly typed you know, uh, 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 schema. right? So as a provider, you say, I'm only going to give you these three things to you because that's what you need. And your consumers are going to just consume those three things. So it's very much driven by the consumer. Consumers are the one deciding what they need. And based on that, I mean, look at GitHub. GitHub has exposed their GraphQL APIs for consumers to you know, use and subscribe to it. An API provider gets a brunt of it because API provider is now handling the full complexity of how to manage that single query in the back end, right? So yes, it's simplification for your consumer, which is what we all want, uh, you know, but at the same time, it's very complicated for our provider. So that's the journey of why graph, 
the, the graph is basically trying to make it simple for your API consumers, developers who are using your APIs. Right? So the advantage goes to the consumer. They get to define the data structure. They don't care about your back end. They really don't know what's going in the back. In REST, at least, you know, if you don't do a good job of defining your APIs, it will expose, uh, it will, it will expose uh, your, uh, you know, your back end. In case of graph, it's, it's pr primarily driven through consumer. So then the question I want to address, the elephant in the room, is you know, what happens, right? Is it REST versus graph, and should we jump onto graph? Uh, my, my simple answer is no. Re graph is not here to replace REST. 10 years from now, maybe it will. But 10 years from now, AI would have taken over the world anyways, right? So it won't matter. <laughs> my point is, there's a reason why REST exists. You know, there's a reason why. You know, REST has well-defined resources. We treat endpoints as resources. There are well-defined operations, verbs, get, post. Uh, there are error codes. When something fails, there is client-side error, server-side error. You know, you get better error coding back then, back from REST. Uh, it's optimized for HTTP protocol. You can cache the responses. So there is a reason why REST exists. So if you have a backend that's, you know, is cons which sends a consistent data back, you may be OK keeping it rest. Don't change it to graph just because. But on the other hand, if you have a data-intensive backend, if your backend data is changing you know, every few often, then maybe GraphQL is a good way to start. And there are tools which uh, you know, earlier mentioned, right? We have open sourced a tool in Node called OS Graph. It's a tool our research team designed it. And that tool is available for anybody to convert a REST backend into a graph QL backend, front end, sorry, endpoint. So you can just take a REST backend and convert it into a graph uh, endpoint. But my, my, my suggestion to you is evaluate why do you need to use graph versus, you know, it's supposedly being a magic sauce. It's not. Because if you do GraphQL, you are taking on a lot more responsibility to be a good citizen in terms of implementing that complexity, which I'm going to show you what happens behind the scenes when you have a GraphQL endpoint. So be cognizant of why you need GraphQL, right? So this is just uh, an example of REST, which is in REST, you know, in order to read, you do a get, right? So get, give me a profile, I get something back. In order to write, you have post where you just post and then you know it updates your your backend right in case of graph everything is a post and the way you write is there is a there is something called as mutation in the query and mutation then goes and updates your 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 backend if i may right so but the point here is it's it's a very specific the way you would write a query is how you would do it but just the you know in terms of how they differ now what happens in the graphql is you know uh, the key takeaway to understand as a provider of uh, a GraphQL endpoint, is this is what your 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 teams your your uh, you know uh, developer sees, but in the back, you are actually making you know seven or eight or ten different calls to just service that one query, right? So as an API developer, all you see and think about as a graphical as a as a you know, um, a, a, a really a, gra a data graph, right? What you're doing is you're creating a data graph of 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 our data. Let's say I want pizza with you know uh, pepperoni, chicken, and and so you're kind of this is your data graph. And when you query that, you you get exactly the same data graph back. But behind the scenes, you're actually making five queries. You know, do I have the ingredients? Do I have the dough? Do I have the stuff? Do I have the oven? Do I have the you know vegetables? Everything that I need. Because as a provider, you are making all those backend calls to make it simple. So imagine the amount of work from a computational standpoint, uh, you know, how, how you can, uh, write your queries uh, falls on you. So that's a key point here that I want to make that uh, you know, uh, API consumers won't care about it, but you will, and you have to. So be careful about when you define it. Now, graph sounds interesting. And before I jump into the API management piece of graph, GraphQL is nothing but a query language, right? I mean, we all have dealt with queries in our past. I mean, like, take any favorite database that you have that has queries. So what have we learned from it? You know, all the lessons that you see as part of a database apply here as well. So can somebody write a poor query? Say, select star from everything I have, and then guess what? All the million records are being queried, and your backend is toast, completely hosed up. So. So as a consumer, I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to ask what I need. And if I don't know what I need, I'll ask for everything, right? 
Um, that's what my kids do. Um, so I'm the, I'm the API management there. Uh, and the second piece here is, uh, you know, I mean, just complex queries, man. Just joins the, the complicated queries that you do that we've done in our past that all applies to GraphQL as well. So what this highlights here is this problem is no new problem to us. But before you jump, you understand the implication of doing it. And by, by saying this is, you know, there are unintended consequences. It could be intentional. Somebody may want to do a, a SQL injection. Maybe you want to really harm your backend. Or it may be unintentional, a poor design of a query that I'm doing. And it's really, you know, bogging down your backend completely. So to, to, to how do you protect yourself against that notion? Right. So some of the some of the things that we have learned as part of API management, the REST API management is, you know, the way to protect yourself against these kind of behaviors, whether they are intentional or they are by design. Oh, sorry, unintentional uh, is you know throttling, rate limiting, understanding the impact of it. So first of all, multiple nested backend calls. Right. So we all understand a single GraphQL results into more than one backend call. In case of REST, that's not the case. In case of REST, it's one-to-one. -one. You make one API call, and you get something in the back. So you still have one-to-one -one relationship. You can control the, the, the blast radius of a malicious query. In this case, you just can. Second is throttling, which is you know uh, protecting the back end where you can understand the transactions. In case of REST API, you have rate limit. You heard about rate limiting, right? Where you can say, hey, if my rate limit is 100 calls per, per, per second, anything more than that, stop. Gateway will stop it right there. So th that's another way to protect it. Uh, variable compute time. Your query for pizza may take 2 milliseconds. My query for pizza may take 5 seconds. Because I'm trying to traverse deeper into the same query versus you are. So the same call to GraphQL server may result in a different compute time in the back end, which means more resources from your standpoint. How do you control that? There is a level of complexity to it. And the last point is I talked about is one way to other limit is also rate limit, right? So these are the lessons that we've learned from uh, a REST API based you know, API management, which actually applies to you know, any other uh, mechanism as well of interaction, graph, events, you can think of. Um, so if I were to net out, what are the core important pieces of uh, you know, API management for GraphQL? So what do we do in, API, in REST APIs, right? We, in REST APIs, you create, you design API, you create the model, you test it, you publish it. There's a life cycle to it. You version it. So that's you know, creation of APIs, management of APIs, which is versioning, life cycle, all of that, analytics security of your APIs, socialization of APIs, which means these APIs are available on a portal. All of those first class treatment applies to graph as well. We're going to talk about two. I want to take you through threat protection. And uh, which one was the, uh, the previous one? Uh, we'll see it again. OK, so let's, let's walk through the flow of graph. And what I mean by graph QL API management. So think of this box here as, as something that you really you know, want to uh, uh, use to protect your backend. So this is your API management for graph. This is your graph server. And this somewhere is your backend, you know, uh, and this is your graph client, right? If you look at, if you Google it, graph IQL is a standard client that you can use to initiate graph QL queries, right? So what happens is when you, when you have a, uh, let me just click here. What you have here is you first have a, you know, between the client and your server, there's a gateway, right? Is it a DMZ or you know, internal external? But there's a runtime gateway that is protecting your backend, which is then defined, which has its policies, OAuth, SSL, mutual auth, basic auth. You define your policies, but there is a management server that's telling the gateway, hey, if anybody comes in, use these policies, and that's kind of protecting it, right? In case of graphs, GraphQL server, what happens is when you initialize. Uh, a graph query, let's say you're exposing a, a graph endpoint, it has a very set of schema that I'm only going to allow somebody to query about the pizza and the ingredients and that's it. What happens is, in, you know, what you need to think about is take that and your gateway would initialize and do an analysis of that query. All right, analysis of that schema. And what I mean by that is, how complicated is your schema? Is it too deeply nested? Is it, does it go back to five different backends or one different backend? So that way, your gateway actually has the insight into how complicated your query is. And then, 
if you get a, and then here's, I've clicked something here which you may not have seen. And then what happens is, once your gateway is aware of your GraphQL you know, query and schemas in the back end, as soon as the call is initiated, uh, it basically says, you know, I need to have employment some information as a query. This query goes in, and then as soon as the query goes in, the gateway analyzes the query, and then the gateway comes back and gives you characteristics of your query. What I mean by this is, this is what is different in GraphQL. This doesn't apply to REST APIs. In case of REST APIs, you make a call, it goes to the gateway, the gateway says, oh, you're a REST API, great. What kind of security do you have? Uh, OAuth, great. I'm gonna authenticate you, you have the token, go, go to the back end, get the data, go back. In case of GraphQL, the way you want to protect depends on the complexity of the query. It's not just rate limit. It's not just transactions per second. It's much more than that. So it's hard to read here, but my deck is available for downloading. The, the point here is you know, nesting. You know, so it, it gives you, hey, you know, you've got a two level of nesting. Uh, you've got six level of resolve complexity. I'll talk about it in the next slide. And then uh, uh, resource complexity. And then the runtime gateway kind of gives you that analysis as a customer to understand how complicated your query is. And then the query goes in, uh, based on your security policies or whatever you've done, the policy gets enforced. The gateway says, yep, I'm going to allow that query. You meet all the criteria for being a secure query, and I'm going to send you to the back end. And then the query goes to the back end, and if everything goes well, then life is awesome, right? So the point being is here is you can use your existing infrastructure, which is your existing gateway. You should be able to. That's our thinking. That's IBM's thinking is your existing gateway should support you to you know, host a GraphQL server in the back in such a way where it, it introspects your queries and protects your backend because your backend is the one that needs the most protection when you talk about GraphQL. It's no different than XML and, and XML SOAP, by the way. Many, many, all, pretty much any, any gateway in the market today, you know, takes the XML, processes it, looks for injection, looks for threat, uh, you know, and, and passes it on back to the backend. That's what you're doing. I also get the question is, does GraphQL need to be part of the gateway? You can debate it, yes and no. I don't have a right answer to it. Uh, again, uh, your gateway is a very secure component of your topology sitting in a DMZ, so you make a choice. Do you want to run business logic or some sort of query uh, resolution within a DMZ or outside DMZ? That's up to you. Our view is we don't see GraphQL sitting inside it. The way we are designing the product is within the product, you would have a policy, drag and drop. You create a nice policy flow of how your API will come in, the response will go out, and behind the scenes, it's gonna to talk to the GraphQL server. All right, and then, and then once everything goes up, you get a result out here saying, here's a user, and here's the stuff, right? This is what I was talking about uh, in terms of the analysis of the schema, right? So the, the gateway, what it does is it basically looks at the query and looks at the schema of GraphQL. So in the previous, you know, if I can go back, let me see. In the previous picture, uh, your GraphQL has the schema, and this is the guy who actually inspects it and says, oh, I understand how complicated you are. And as a product manager of GraphQL, this is what you need. If you are a product manager who's actually exposing APIs, and I was in the previous session that AFP had, it was a really good session about you know, how the APIs were exposed. If you're a product manager, you really need to understand that just by rate limiting GraphQL query, you won't help anybody. You really need to understand the complexity of the query that you're exposing to your users. So if I come here, this is as a product manager, you're gonna say, oh, I see. I'm, I'm gonna allow you know, two levels of nesting in my query, right? Which means, which means, Think threat protection. How much, how much are you careful about protecting your back end? Uh, I'm going to allow maximum five users from this company A. Fine. Think of that as a control or a, or, or a pricing metric. Right? You may want to go out in the market and say, hey, we're going to allow you GraphQL, but after five users, I'm going to charge you 10 cents per user. All right, fine. And then last one is the type complexities, which is you know, resolve complexity, which is if you go into the back end and if you're making five back end calls, that means something. If you're making 10 back end calls, that means something. Right? So this is the insight you need as part of your gateway strategy from GraphQL server to, uh, to make an informed decision as a product manager. And hence, my earlier comment was be careful about GraphQL. It, it sounds great. It is great. It, 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 it is, I love it. But just be mindful of what you're doing with it. All right? So threat protection, 
uh, you know, just what I t talked about earlier as, a, as part of the gateway and the analysis that we do, we can then start to perform, you know, detect and reject requests, right? Some requests may not, you may not want to accept those requests. Uh, Pre-calculate the load. Some queries are going to be very heavy on your CPU in the back end. Some queries won't be. You can actually pre-calculate. If I submit a query to the gateway, gateway is going to intercept it and say, wait a minute, this is going to cost you a lot if this query goes in versus this query may not, right? So you can pre-calculate. In fact, GitHub does it today. What GitHub has done, and if you can follow this hyperlink here, what GitHub has done is they have a point or a weight scoring system, which means every query that you actually submit uh, to GitHub, uh, it will assign a score. And based on the score, it will execute that query. It allows you to actually, even before you run the query, you can see what score and what complexity, how complex your query is, which is really cool. You know, you want to understand. And that's why this is a new model, new way to think about APIs. We are not used to thinking about it. We were not used to think about it that way, you know, a year ago. And this will take a lot of education. This will take a lot of evangelism to truly understand what do you want to do with your graph and how do you want to monetize it? And by monetize it, I don't mean just you know, charge somebody, but how do you want to go to market with something like GraphQL, right? Um, so pretty interesting way to do it. We are also looking, doing in some similar fashion where we expose you know, how do you want to, as a product manager of an API, uh, you know, assign some points and do it, right? The, the other piece I want to talk quickly about is, and let me check on time here. Uh, okay, nobody's killing me, so I'm good. Uh, uh, API plans, right? So, so you, as a product manager, you can choose to define, you know, different tiers of plans that you offer, uh, which could be essentials. I mean, REST is everywhere. You, it's a commoditized way of accessing data. Fine, you've got REST. Ma you know, business is maybe Kafka, maybe even driven becomes your, you know, part two or, or plan number, and then, and then a higher value plan is enterprise, where you then offer, you know, graph, right? So this is like a Russian doll model, right? Enterprise includes business, business includes essentials. So as part of enterprise, you get everything. So as a product manager, you can differentiate uh, the type of services you're providing to your customers and offer different types of SLAs. In this case, uh, you can even go deeper, right? So we talked about how you differentiate, thank you, how you differentiate uh, between the queries. So now as a product manager, when you expose your APIs, uh, GraphQL or maybe some other technologies, you can actually introspect and say, you know what, I'm going to have 10 levels deep as gold and then 100 levels deep as, uh, as my platinum or you know, my, my plan. And in the back, if you go back and actually truly look at their architecture in the back, all you have is you know, a production system here, maybe a containerized environment here, or something that is very, very you know, strong to handle the delays, the, the CPU cost, associated with that query versus something that's in the essentials, right? So that's the consideration you need to take as a product manager and as a product, as a product guy, as myself, right, who, who, form, who builds platform, right? My job is to make an API management platform. That's how we are thinking about GraphQL, about protecting it, about giving you the ability to, you know, have the right levers. So when you go to market to your customers, you know how to charge and, and what to do with it, right? So that's, that's, a value from a from a product management standpoint and threat protection and that we talked about earlier. So for my last four minutes, if I were to sub summarize again the takeaways, right, which is what is GraphQL? GraphQL enables the users, your API developers, to ask for something and they get exactly that. They don't get anything more, they don't get anything less. GraphQL management, if you're thinking about API management for GraphQL, what we've done in IBM is, first of all, we've open sourced ability for you to create GraphQL APIs from REST APIs, because that's where you will start. Or maybe you'll start from Greenfield APIs. Fine with us. But it's a node-based, you know, uh, in loopback available for download, you know, from GitHub. Uh, so you can download it. And so that's just a way of creation. So as I talked about, there's creation of APIs, management of APIs, so socialization, security, and then analytics, right? The second piece that we are investing right now is around the management piece, which is first-class support for GraphQL. So when you look at GraphQL API management, look at you know vendors that provide you this first-class support where you can version the GraphQL APIs internally. Uh, there is lifecycle to it. There is threat protection, ability for you to truly understand the nesting insight of you know the the 
the schema is 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 what you define as part of your query and and how can you get generate insights from it which 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 the platform will give back to you to to charge to your customers and then graphql enables you to have differentiated plans threat protection and things that you intend to do with it i think that was my last slide here so uh, any questions comments feedback